Hey everyone and welcome back, my name is Hamish Hodder and in today's video we're going to be going through Warren Buffett's latest letters to the shareholders. Now of course, every single year Berkshire Hathaway has to report their earnings and a part of that annual report is to provide a letter to the shareholders, a letter describing the performance of the year uh, and as well as other various things from the CEO and the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway is of course Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time. So it is always great to read through these letters to the shareholders uh, and see what information he provides because not only does he provide great information about the businesses operating within Berkshire Hathaway and the performance of the business over the past year, he also includes a lot of valuable information for long-term value investors. So that's what I'm going to be breaking down in today's video. If you do enjoy the video, make sure you leave a like and let me know your thoughts on the letter down in the comment section below. But for now guys, let's jump into it. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go through some major parts that I think will provide a ton of value for those who are looking to be long-term investors. I'll read through the part and then I'll explain what I think he means and how you can apply that in your own investing. So the first part is at the very start of the letter and it's where Warren Buffett talks about book value and market value. Buffett says that for nearly three decades, the initial paragraph included the percentage change in Berkshire's per share book value. And it's now time to abandon that practice. The fact is that the annual change in Berkshire's book value is a metric that has lost the relevance that it once had. And he describes three circumstances that make this so. The first is that Berkshire has been changing over time from a company that has had most of its assets in marketable securities in stocks to a business that has most of its assets in operating businesses. So Berkshire has been changing from a company that has been mostly stock where Buffett has been spending a lot of the internal earnings on buying marketable securities on buying pieces of businesses. But over time that has changed from it being a majority of marketable securities to now being a majority of operating businesses, which is businesses that Buffett owns outright, or he owns a private stake in with another partner. And the reason that this change means that book value is no longer a valid method of evaluating the value within Berkshire Hathaway is because accounting rules that Berkshire Hathaway has to follow, the GAAP rules, G-A-A-P, generally applied accounting principles, they say that for these operating businesses, which are now the majority of Berkshire Hathaway, they will be included within Berkshire's book value, but their retained earnings and other things that are within the business are not included in Berkshire's financial statements. And for that reason, the book value of Berkshire Hathaway massively now understates the true value of the company. Another reason that he gives is that Berkshire is going to be a significant repurchaser of its own shares. So since Berkshire Hathaway trades above book value most of the time, so the price that you pay is more than the book value within the company, that means that when Berkshire Hathaway buys back their own shares, most of the time, it's going to cause a reduction in book value. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad investment or a bad decision by management for shareholders because you can make or they can make a repurchase of their shares above book value, but it can still be below intrinsic value, which essentially means that over time as they repurchase shares, book value might come down, but the intrinsic value per share for, uh, for shareholders will be going up which means that the decrease in book value per share won't be representative of the value given to shareholders, which is really the intrinsic value per share. And it's because of these reasons that Buffett thinks that Berkshire's long-term stock price growth or market value is much more representative of the performance and the ret value returned to shareholders. So instead of using book value per share growth as a benchmark against the S&P 500, he is now going to be using the market value increase per share as an indication of, of whether or not they're, they're providing enough value to shareholders against just investing in something like the S&P 500 index. Next is a paragraph that is titled, focus on the forest, not the trees. And here he says that investors who evaluate Berkshire sometimes obsess on the detail of our many and diverse businesses our economic trees, so to speak. 
Analysis of this type can be mind-numbing, and given that we own a vast array of specimens, ranging from twigs to redwoods, a few of our trees are diseased and unlikely to be around in a decade from now, and many others, though, are destined to grow in size and beauty. Fortunately, it is not necessary to evaluate each tree individually in order to make a rough estimation of Berkshire's intrinsic value. That's because the forest contains five groves of major importance, and he goes on to talk about that. But essentially what he's saying here is that investors often obsess about the very specifics of the company. Now, of course, you do need to understand how the company operates and what are the key factors that influence the profitability of a company over time. But Buffett suggests here that you don't need to know every single little bit about what is going on within the company, every single tiny little detail, and you don't need to obsess over those little details in order to come to a rough intrinsic value of a business. The rationalization for this is that it would be impossible for a retail or an individual investor to go through and rationally assess every single decision that a management has to make. And if you could do that, if you could accurately evaluate and appropriately evaluate every decision that management is going to make, then you should be the one running the company, not them. So it's just not rational to believe that you could possibly understand every decision that a company makes, every investment that a company makes. And for that reason, you can step back from looking at the very specifics of the company for a second. And instead, you can just see who is managing that forest who is planting the seeds and who is watering that forest. Rather than worrying about specific trees within that forest, this one's not doing too well, this one's doing well, but this one's absolutely killing the forest. Trust in the management team that runs the company. Trust in the management team that is making those decisions. And in order to trust the management team in making those decisions, you need to assess management exclusively. You need to make sure that they are highly skillful and highly competent at making uh, capital allocation decisions, so putting money where it's gonna grow into more money, and also managing debt so that it isn't going to bring down the whole company. And by doing this, it means that you don't have to worry about every single little decision that management makes, because you just trust that their past performance of consistently making good and smart and safe investments for shareholders will continue, and that on average, that f those trees will be good and it will grow into a great forest. There might be a couple of bad trees in there, but if on average that management team has made very good decisions in the past and has acceptably managed their debt and kept it to a low level so that it's not going to destroy the company, then you can just put your faith in the management that they're going to be able to invest at a somewhat similar uh, rate going forward into the future. Now, this certainly doesn't excuse you from learning about the key factors that influence the business and understanding the industries that you're investing in and understanding how consumers are going to behave around the products that are in your industry. But it means that while you're learning about a company over the next few years, if you trust the management team and if management has been consistently investing successfully, then you can be confident while you continue to learn about this company because you can't just learn about a company for a few months and know everything. Your competence and your understanding of a company will be generated over many years, over you learning about that company and researching that industry over you know, five, 10 or even more years. So while that is happening, you don't want to have to be worrying about every single little decision. And for that reason, Buffett suggests that you should always invest in companies that have a highly competent and transparent management. Then there was a part where Buffett talks about maintenance capital expenditure, depreciation and growth capital expenditure. And this is something that I've been learning a lot about in the past year, uh, and it is really important to grasp and it's great that he reiterates it here. So Buffett says here that Berkshire's $8.4 billion depreciation charge understates our true economic cost. In fact, we need to spend more than this sum annually to simply remain competitive in many of our operations. Beyond those maintenance capital expenditures, we spend large sums in pursuit of growth. Overall, Berkshire invested a record $14.5 billion last year in plant equipment and other fixed assets, with 89% of that spent in America. So here Buffett explains why you should be focusing on capital expenditures rather than depreciation, because in this example, the depreciation charge that Berkshire took, the non-cash expense that is supposed to represent 
how much the company deteriorated in the last year in terms of their long-term assets. That number that was reported on their income statement was actually less than how much they actually spent to maintain the business. So it's better to look at the cash flow statement and have a look at those capital expenditures to see how much cash they're actually spending to maintain the business and to grow the business. Rather than looking at this depreciation charge that is a non-cash charge that is often got nothing to do with how much money the company is actually spending to repair buildings and repair equipment and that sort of thing, just look at the actual numbers and that is what Buffett suggests here. He suggests that you should calculate what the maintenance component is of capital expenditure because capital expenditure is a lump sum of uh, maintenance and growth. And you need to separate that out and work out what is maintenance and what is growth. And the reason that you should be doing this is because maintenance capital expenditure does exactly what it sounds like. It maintains the business. It restores the assets to how they were a year prior. And that means that those, those spendings on those uh, capital expenditures don't provide any added value to shareholders. Because if a building deteriorates from one year to the next, and then the company spends some money to restore it, there's no value added there. The, the building is just back where it was a year ago. However, there's also growth uh, capital expenditure. And this is where they buy more buildings, they buy more equipment, they expand their manufacturing ca capacity or something along those lines, depending on what business it is. Those growth capital expenditures do provide value added because it means that they can manufacture more, they can manufacture more quickly maybe, or more cheaply, and that is going to be value added. So an important part of your analysis is to work out how much of that capital expenditure, which is often recorded as property, plant, and equipment on the cash flow statement under the investing activities title. Um, that number, you need to be able to separate that into how much is for maintenance and how much is for growth because the growth component is how much is going to be uh, value added for you, spending that is adding value, and maintenance is something that it should be expensed and should be taken away from how much cash is going to be returned to owners. And I've got one more paragraph here that I thought was super important from the Berkshire Hathaway letter. And he says here is that, here is one example drawn from the table above. Berkshire's holdings of American Express has remained unchanged for the past eight years. Meanwhile, our ownership increased from 12.6% to 17.9% uh, because of repurchases made by the company. Last year, Berkshire's portion of $6.9 billion earned by American Express was $1.2 billion, about 96% of the $1.3 billion that we paid for our stake in the company. When earnings increase and shares outstanding decrease, owners over time usually do well. Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway haven't added to their American Express position in over eight years. However, the percentage of the company that they own has increased by 5.3%. And the simple reason for that is because American Express bought back their own shares. Now this goes back to the thing where we said they can buy back shares over book value and it will decrease book value per share. But if the company's intrinsic value is above what the company is buying back their shares at, then over the long term, that will be beneficial to the person who owns the stock. And this is a prime example of this. So American Express was buying back their own stock and they were buying it back at above book value, which meant book value per share for shareholders went down. However, the company then went on to increase their earnings drastically. So that means that because earnings increased, the market price of the stock has also increased dramatically over that time. And as a result, those shares repurchased by the company have returned a satisfactory return to shareholders such as Warren Buffett. If you own a company and the company buys back its own shares, it's essentially the same thing as you buying more shares. The outcome is the exact same. You have less cash either from your own bank account because you buy more shares or you have less cash because the company spends some of the cash to buy back its own shares because that cash is yours as well, remember, because you own the company. So cash goes down and then you own a greater percentage of the company because if you buy more shares, you own more of the shares, therefore you own a greater percentage. And if the company that you own buys back some of its shares, the number of shares outstanding decreases, which means that the ones that you hold 
become more valuable and you own more of a percentage. And if over time that company earns more for its owners, so the earnings increase and they compound over time, that means that people are going to be willing to pay more for those shares. And it means that if you buy shares and the market price goes up, you make a return. And in the same way, if you own a company and it buys back shares and then the price goes up, the company makes money on those shares because those shares have been deleted and they make profit on the shares that remain. So it means that if a company is growing their earnings, which is what Buffett says at the end of this paragraph, if a company is growing earnings and decreasing the number of shares outstanding, then most of the time that's going to lead to a profitable outcome for the owners. So those are some of the important parts that I grabbed from Berkshire Hathaway's latest letter. I'll leave a link to it down in the description below if you wanna check it out and read the whole thing. I highly suggest you do. Uh, and also if you wanna check out the CNBC interview where he talks about a lot of these things, I was going to make a video on it, but the interview is two hours long and I really couldn't decide what I wanted to include. So I'll leave a link to that CNBC interview down there as well so that you can hear Buffett explain some of the things that he said in the letters to the shareholders. But I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And if you did, of course, make sure you leave a like and become a subscriber if you wanna see more content like this. But for now guys, I'll see you in the next one.